Guild Wars, Sea of Sorrows. Chapter 6 A Sailor's Life's Filled with Toil and Strife The seas both boon and bane Were cried abound on a northern tide Through the lightning and the rain We'll sail through all these stormy nights Till we're safe at home again Weather the storm I can't think I should think of something What? What was I doing? Something important I need to think how do I make my mind focus? Draw the bilge rat up. A lurch rolled through Kobaya's stomach, and he felt himself purge its contents. The effort didn't stop the motion that rocked him back and forth, and he tightened his hands on the sheets wrapped about his body, unsure if he was clinging to them or struggling to push them away. Where was he? What had happened? Opening his eyes brought a painful flash of white-hot light. Kobaya whimpered in distress. Wherever he was, he wasn't dead. Look at him puke! A too-close voice roared. This little mouse is still fighting to live. Cut its throat, like any other gaping fish, snarled another with a ringing laugh, then throw it back into the sea. There were shouts of agreement all around. Hesitantly, Kobaya forced his eyes to focus making himself ignore the pain that racked every muscle and bone of his body. He lay on the deck of an unfamiliar ship, fouled in the knots of rigging, still attached to a chunk of the indomitable's foremast. Someone was using a sharp knife to cut the ropes. With a groan, Kobaya tried to roll over, but found himself too tightly tangled in the cords that held him to the thick spar of wood. Memories twisted confusedly in Kobaya's mind. Tosh, laughing and grabbing for the rag doll. The officers standing on the forecastle. The shine of a polished glow on brass arms. The billowing of white sails. Sethus grinning like a monkey as he swung from spar to spar. A dark land beyond the edge of the storm. Keep it alive for now, another voice grated. And there was a thump, 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 echoing closer across the boards of the deck. Kobaya tried to focus his eyes on the motion, hoping to see a familiar face, or at least the recognizable colors of a Crichton officer's coat. Instead, the face that leaned close to study him wasn't human at all. The horrible features were feline, the skin covered with thick white patterned fur. A black nose sniffed distastefully, and the mouth parted to show a row of long, sharp teeth in the jaws of a predator. The creature moved with eerie grace, its paw-like hands shore on the ropes, tremendous claws sliding out of their sheaths to slice through the bonds tangled all around Kobia. Kobaya stared in horror as two ears cocked forward curiously at the base of the long skull, and two more swept back with disgust. Long black horns and braids wrapped in leather thongs and straps of shark skin lay amid the heavy mane that rippled down the curve of the beast's thick neck. Claws, horns, four ears. Kobaya struggled with an uncertain, quickly rising sense of alarm. That thing called me a mouse. You're sure it's worth bothering with, engineer? Kobaya could barely believe he was hearing understandable words from the monster's fanged muzzle. Seems like we're just searching for drake eggs in the forest here. Complete waste of time. The white-furred brute leaned closer, his eye glinting with feral cruelty as it looked Cobia up and down. I'm certain, Centurion. It coughed up enough water to flood a small village. But give it a little rest, and you'll see. The first voice had more humor, less threat. Hoping to see a friendly face, Cobia placed it amid the blurry shapes marking a big, rust-colored beast standing a short distance behind the other, fighting down the bile that rose in his throat. Kobaya refocused his attention on the tawny yellow eyes that glared into his own, struck by the cruel intelligence he saw there. The beast noticed and grunted, poking Kobaya with a sharp black claw. A speck of blood rose where the needle-sharp point scratched the flesh of his cheek, and Kobaya flinched away. Suddenly, he realized what they were, and his stomach revolted again. This time, 
in fear. These were Char. Fine. The word curled out of the Char centurion's lips. As much a curse as a confirmation. Your responsibility, then. Take the mouse below, but keep it on a leash. When your pet's done puking, you can put it to work in the engine room, singing you pretty songs and worshipping anything that stands still. There was a cacophony of howls at the jibe, the mocking, terrible laughter of hyenas closing in for the kill. The awful sound swelled and filled Kobaya's mind as blackness claimed him once more. Kobaya wasn't sure how long he had been asleep. He could feel the rhythmic rise and fall of the sea surrounding him, but this was not the ship he knew. The bed was far too large, a thin shelf hanging from the wall rather than a hammock cradled between two poles. Glancing around to get his bearings, Kobaya recognized that he was in a berth, surrounded by similar sleeping shelves, each with a thin mattress and a worn wool cover. This was definitely a ship, but it wasn't like anything he'd ever been on before. He could feel that she was a sizable craft, but not as large as the Indomitable. Maybe a small galleon or a brig? Kobaya could see the ribs of the hull holding up the curved wall. They weren't made of wood but of iron, and forged U-shaped brackets solidified the ship's frame. The beams were heavier, the doors wider, and the beds far more solid than those on a human ship. Curious, Kobaya sat up in bed, surveying the room more carefully. There had to be other crew quarters. The number of beds here would barely man a sloop, much less a large ship like a galleon. On a shelf at the foot of the bed lay his clothing, relatively clean and folded, as well as the pilot's astrolabe and the small rag doll he'd had tied to his belt. Although his knife sheath was there, it was empty, and only one of his boots had made it out of the sea. Kobaya tugged the clothing on over his head and felt the ache of sore muscles stretching through his frame. Rope burns marked his chest, legs, and arms where he had been tangled. He considered the boot, but decided not to wear it. Two bare feet would be better for keeping his footing on board a pitching ship. Cautiously, Kobaya touched his fingers to his wounds. They'd been treated with some kind of strange-smelling greenish goop that had dried upon his skin. Suspiciously, he scraped a bit of it away with his fingernail. It smelled of fish oil and pungent herb. Heavy, booted footfalls stomped down the stairwell outside the sleeping area. Kobaya scrambled back. The Shar were coming. Kobaya glanced around in panic. The arched doorway was the only way out of the room. He was trapped. Quickly, he looked around for a weapon, a board, or anything to fight with. But the biggest thing in the room was a pillow. Left with no choice, he grabbed it and spun to face the door. Out of the dark passage came a char. He was a bulky fellow, wide-shouldered, standing more than a head taller than the slender human youth. The monster's thick fur was the color of rust, touched here and there with scalloped leopard-like spots of darker brown and black on his arms and legs. He had a paler muzzle, more of a rusty white, and the lighter shade spread across his chest and down the insides of his arms. Massive ram's horns spread out on either side of his head, and four slender ears flicked back and forth below them. Kobaya recognized the creature. This was the char that had rescued him from the sea, the one they'd called Engineer. The monster moved like water over glass, each padding stride cushioned by cat-like paws. Before he entered the room, he paused, sniffing at the air, black lips curling back from curved, meat-ripping teeth. Ha! Huh. The Shar tilted his head, four ears flicking forward and back. Awake already, are we, Mouse? Growling faintly to himself, the beast took another step into the doorway, and his golden eyes searched the semi-darkness until he found Kobaya. For a long moment the two stared at one another. The char's dark eyes flicked from Kobaya's hastily raised pillow to the tray that he carried in his clawed hands. At last the beast broke the silence, saying wryly, I know the grub's not good, but I don't consider soup to be a killing offense. Kobaya couldn't help it. 
the stress of his ordeal coupled with the entirely ridiculous situation overcame him. He started snickering. The Shar, seemingly amused by his own joke, quickly joined in. The chuckling became guffaws, and those soon turned into howls of laughter. Sitting down on the bed, the burly Char put the tray on the floor between them and wiped tears from his eyes with the back of his hand. Kobaya lowered the pillow and gathered enough breath to ask, You're not going to kill me? Kill you? answered the Char. If I was going to kill you, I wouldn't have hauled you up onto the deck in the first place. You moon-headed idiot. Despite his reassuring words, the Char's muzzle seemed perpetually drawn into a snarl. And the claws on his paws were as sharp as daggers. The Char sniffed the air again, and his long auburn tail twitched on the bunk. Smells like your wounds healing, too. No infection. Would I go to that kind of trouble just to cut you open again for jollies? I don't know. You're a char. Kobaya struggled with his fear. You did save me, but I don't know why. You had to have a reason. Still, he slowly lowered the pillow, the rich, warm smell of the soup nearly overcoming him. I'm the one who saw you floating out there, spar and all. Been out there since the wave hit, I'd wager and that was three days before we found you. We saw no sign of your ship or your crew. The rust-colored char watched Kobaya out of the corners of his eyes. Lost, I'd imagine. Kobaya managed a nod. Last thing I remember, the indomitable turned on her side in the water. The wave swallowed her whole. He gulped, the adrenaline beginning to run cold in his veins. He shook off the feeling and faced the char. What happens now? Now you put down the pillow, human, and you work a char ship. I... What? Stunned, Kobaya sank down to a seat on the floorboards, leaning back against the shelf bed with the pillow limp in his hand. Work? With char? What? Until you eat me? Eat you? The char snorted, shaking his four ears disdainfully. Arrogant mouse. I saved your life. Suspicious, Kobaya pressed him. You're a char. I'm a human. You had to have a reason. The big leopard-spotted char threw up his clawed hands in frustration. Pish. The waves tossed more fish to the surface than I've ever seen before. What do you think that is in front of you? We've got plenty of food. We need workers to keep this tub floating long enough to get us safely to shore. So it's slavery, then, Kobaya said grimly. Consider it indentured service. Once the ship finds landfall, we'll go our way, and you can go yours. We're not a slave ship. When that wave hit us, we lost half our crew, and we were running short-handed as it was. Now we barely have enough sailors on board to trim the sails and heft the rudder. More, the ship's damaged. She'll never make a southern port so we'll have to find a closer one and hope for the best, which is going to be hard considering how far that wave tossed us off course. To be honest, I don't think the Centurion has any idea where we are. The Char's words were gruff, but not unkind. Your fate's tied with ours, human. The sooner you get used to that fact, the sooner we all get out of this mess. The Char gave Kobaya a long look, his cat-like eyes unreadable. With a raspy cough, the creature changed the subject. He flexed his fist, and the claws disappeared under the fur. My name's Psychox. Psychox, steam shroud. The Shar held out one paw in an unexpected gesture of camaraderie. Kobaya stared at the extended paw, noting the sharpness of the claws, the thick fur that covered fingers and wrist. Then, with a sigh, he took the proffered paw and shook it stumbling over the creature's strange name. Sick Ox? Close enough, close enough. Psych Ox. I'm the engineer on this brig. I'm Cobia Mariner, lately of the crew of the Indomitable. Friends call me Kobe. Or they used to. The words hung heavily in the air. Sethis. Vost. Even bullying Tosh and pompous, self-important Captain Whiting. Dead. 
It was hard to believe that he was the only one who had survived. Titan's blood, human, you're white with hunger. If you don't eat that soup right now, one of your flower-headed gods is going to show up and take you home, and put all my effort to waste. The char's tail twitched higher, though whether out of amusement or annoyance. Kobaya couldn't tell. Eat. I'll talk. Against his better judgment, Kobaya reached out and grabbed the soup bowl, scooting away from the char to sit on the berth across from him. The soup was thin, but the fish was fresh, and it tasted of strange spices that burned against his tongue. Our ship is the Havoc, an iron legion tub sailing out of the coastal fort south of the Shiver Peaks. My warband, the Steam Warband, is one of two assigned to sail her. We used to be a crew of seventeen, Psychox said. But now we're a crew of seven. He sighed and lashed his tail. The Iron Legion's original goal was to create a naval unit that could challenge Krita for control of the Sea of Sorrows. Maybe make an assault on Lion's Arch. As Kobaya began to bristle, Psychox chuckled ruefully. What do you expect? We're at war, human. Oh, see, Mon, it's no use getting your dander up. I bet the whole damn fort's gone now, town and all, wiped clean by the wave. We've been pushed so far north by that wave there's nowhere else to dock. We're limping for the shallows around Lion's Arch and just hoping we can make it that far. Lion's Arch? Are you mad? That's the capital of Krita. If a char ship shows up there, the crew will be hung on the gallows before you can drop anchor. Psychox shrugged. Maybe so, but we've no choice. The only other dock that might have survived is Port Stalwart, and that harbor's too shallow for our ship. What else can we do? Our hull's damaged, and the mast steps are cracked. Our sails are torn, the engines laboring, and we can't trust the keel to hold if this old brig finds another storm. Confused, Kobaya spluttered into the dwindling remains of his soup. Engine? Yes, boss. Psychox crossed his furry arms over his massive chest. That's my design. The Imperator of the Iron Legion wanted us to push the boundaries. So I did. Took one of the experimental engines we've been working on and built her into the brig. Coal-foddered pistons propel a turbine beneath her stern, pushing us forward. With that, plus the wind in her jibs, she'll go half again as fast as one of your human galleons. We can turn ninety degrees and not lose speed. Doesn't matter what direction the wind's coming from. We can strike out with it or against it and still make ground. The big char's smile faded. Unfortunately, the Havoc's the only one of her kind. We were out of harbor on a test run for the engine. When the wave hit, that's the only reason we survived at all. What made it? asked Kobaya. The wave, I mean. The big char shook his furry head. Nobody knows. One minute the ocean was quiet, and the next. We were sweeping before a sheet of water higher than the great northern wall. Taking a long breath, Kobaya ran one hand through his hair and tried to remember. We'd just passed Malkor's fingers, headed toward Orr. Our ship was in combat with some sort of creature. It wasn't going well. I was in the rigging, trying to free the broken mast, and I got tangled. When the ship went down, he halted, wiping his sweating face with a torn sleeve. I saw beyond the wave as it caught us. I thought. I thought I saw land. Land? Out there? There are no islands that deep in the Sea of Sorrows. Psychox furrowed his brow. You didn't imagine it? A fever dream, maybe. While you were shipwrecked? It wasn't a dream, Kobaya said firmly. I saw mountains. A black plain and high peaks beyond. Ruins and, he paused, people. Things that looked like people, at least. Now I know it was a fever dream. The Shar shook his head. Hurry up and finish your soup, Mouse. I'm ordered to bring you on deck to meet Centurion Harrow, and that's the last thing you want to do on an empty stomach. After the soup was gone, Kobaya followed Psychox out of the berth. 
It was clear from the moment he set foot on deck that the havoc wasn't like any other galleon Kobe had seen. To start with, it was smaller from stem to stern than human galleons, but wider through the mid-deck and the rear. Two masts stood side by side on the ship's open deck, rather than stretching stem to stern. Their sails were triangular and oddly rigged, ropes running to the fore rather than square blocked to the mast. A strange musky odor hung in the air, not that of wild animals or feral cats, as he would have guessed, but rather a thick, sulfurous smoke. None of the furred sailors seemed distressed at the smell, and he assumed they knew their ship better than he did, so Cobia tried to put it out of his mind. It must have been the scent of the Havoc's engine. The ship's main deck was crewed by seven sailors, a pitifully small number, even with Psycox brag that they needed fewer to run the ship. There was a high forecastle and a rear quarter-deck, but no captain's quarters and no decorative brass. It seemed the centurion, whoever he was, slept with the men, somewhere in the main berth. Above the rear of the ship rose two short cylindrical chimneys of iron that chuffed out streams of grayish smoke. A thumping, uneven rhythm emanated from the area below the quarter-deck, matching the ship's strangely jolting movement forward against the sea. Worse, it was filled with char. White-furred ones, as well as brown, black, and tawny many marked with stripes or spots amid their tufted fur. They moved about the deck with ease, claws sinking into the wooden floor to hold them steady in a swell, and clawed, paw-like hands, working rigging as deftly as any human sailor. Just like Psychox, they all had horns, four ears, and long waving tails, but each was nevertheless distinctive. Some were brawny, some slender, one had shaved most of his mane away, leaving only a stiff crest, while another had waxed braids woven through his, giving the char a fierce, bristling appearance. A slender char, one that Kobaya guessed might be a female, sat on her haunches near the ship's bow, playing a low, mournful rhythm on a drum. Others repaired injury done to the hull by the mighty wave. Even though few of the beasts turned to look at Kobaya, he could feel their attention riveted on him, the way he'd seen stalking felines in Lion's Arch pretending not to notice an injured bird before they pounced. Kobaya took a deep breath to settle his nerves, then immediately regretted it. The whole ship smelled like wet cat. Psychox took Kobaya to the forecastle, ignoring their pointed gazes and low snarls. Kobaya felt his hackles rise at their stairs and thought immediately of Tosh. If he picked a fight with these bullies, it wouldn't matter if Kobaya gotten a few good hits. He'd be dead. The thought chilled Kobaya's usual daredevil nature, and he stayed close to Psychox. They passed a black-furred beast with narrow yellow eyes, sharpening a long, wicked-looking knife against a leather strap the swish-swish echoing in time with Kabaya's steps. Another, his fur streaked with gray and his body slightly bowed from age, lowered his head and growled a warning as the human walked past. Hail, Centurion Harrow! Psychok's bellow almost made Kabaya leap out of his skin. An even larger char at the bow of the ship turned his head to regard them thoughtfully. His title might have been Centurion, but Kobaya recognized the stern aura of a captain without any need for explanation. This soldier was in charge. This was the pale furred beast who had threatened him when he'd first come aboard. Harrow was shorter than Psychox, but even more muscular, with white fur marked by gray and a sharp, fierce cast to his muzzle. He had many scars lacing his fur and face and his left leg below the knee had been replaced by a thick peg of iron. He wore clothes like a human, but far less than most sailors Kobai had known, leather straps to hold his weapon to his side, and a simple pair of breeches, no hat, no shirt, and no shoes. Kobaya's knees shook, but he locked them together. Conscious of his pounding heart, and the expectant silence that fell over the rest of the animals. As he struggled to show no fear, 
Kobaya found himself wondering if the char's leg was strapped on, or if some awful surgeon had fused the metal directly to the stump of the centurion's bone. However it was on there, the leader of the char clearly considered it a wound worthy of pride, for as he came closer, he made no effort to hide his sullen limp. Suddenly, Kobaya was glad he hadn't worn the single boot. The centurion tapped the fingers of one clawed hand against a piece of parchment tucked into his belt. He waved away the other char clustered about, and they obediently backed off a few steps so that the centurion could take a good look at Kobia. The humans awake, sir. Psychox spoke altogether too cheerfully for Kobia's comfort. So I see, growled the centurion, unamused. Another char. This one, a thick-limbed, tawny beast, gave an indignant snarl. What is this foolishness, sir? We're not a menagerie. I told you, the human's useless. Unless we're planning to toss him over the side as bait to catch our dinner. A soft rumble of eager laughter coursed through the other sailors on the deck. Kobaya gulped nervously, acutely aware that he was the only one without claws. One of the centurion's paws shot up, fist clenched in an unspoken command, and the crew fell into instant, obedient silence. Lowering his hand, the leader gestured to Kobaya's escort. Kobaya Mariner, this is Centurion Harrow Shroudweather, leader of the Shroud Warband, and Captain of the Havoc. Psychox stiffened into a salute. Sir, this is the human who washed up on our hull. He tried to attack me with a pillow, but he settled in well enough once I told him what's what. Unflattering, Kobaya thought with a wince, but true. Centurion Harrow rocked back and forth on his peg leg. Rather than being offended by Kobaya's apparent show of defiance, the captain looked vaguely pleased. Going to take on an entire char crew with a pillow, were you, Mouse? A titter went through the troops, and Harrow silenced them with a glare. Yes, sir. Kobaya lifted his chin and met the centurion's tawny eyes. I recommend you all surrender now. You have no idea the things I can do with a handful of chicken feathers. A loud burst of laughter erupted from the gathered char. Surprised, centurion Harrow's eyebrows shot up into his mane, and he snapped his teeth together with amusement. You're a bold one, you are. He chuckled the sound rumbling through the centurion's broad chest. His lips curled back from his sharp white canines, and Kobaya realized that Harrow was smiling. Good. I like a little spirit. Psychox argues that my ship's better off with you on it and alive. You're certainly a sight better off in that case, so it's to your advantage that you prove your worth. Understood? The last words were barked with a curt military precision. Kobaya jumped. He stood at attention and stammered, Why, yes, sir. Good. The centurion raised an eyebrow. His lips curled into a faint, wicked smile. While you are here, you are a soldier on this ship, a gladium, with no warband at your side and the lowest rank aboard. You have two duties on this ship, gladium cobia. The first is to do any job you're told, and the second is to obey any order you're given. We're short-handed by the claw, and you'll pull your weight or you'll be ballast. Yes, sir, Kobaya managed to say. He had no idea what a gladium was, but he wasn't going to ask questions. Not when all the char around him were staring like hungry cats over a roasted haunch of Dahlia. And here I was, hoping he'd make a mess of things. Grist Felstein, the oldest of the char, chuckled, wheezing slightly. Ah, well. He's skinny. Probably wouldn't make a meal anyway. So we might as well work him hard, eh? Grist? The char leader nodded his head in agreement, ears flicking back and forth beneath his coiled horns. Turning back to Kobaya, Harrow raised one clawed hand and rubbed the fur on his chin. When we arrive in Lion's Arch, you and Psychox will take one of the lifeboats and row to the docks. Tell them we come in peace. If you don't convince the Lion Guard to let us dock and make repairs, Psychox kills you. Then the humans at the port will kill him. 
If that happens, our ship won't dock. And as we can't make it to another port without repairs, the havoc sinks. We drown. Harrow narrowed his eyes like a feral creature, his sharp claw raking through his rough whiskers. In this scenario, everybody dies, including you. Understood, soldier? Agreed, Kobaya pledged. I'd say that's a fair trade for my life. Understood, engineer? Centurion Harrow rounded on Psychox, his voice taking on a bellow of command. Yes, sir. Psychox's yell rang out on instinct. Realizing what he'd agreed to, the rust-furred char nodded as well, all four ears drooping in worry beneath his heavy horns. He managed a salute, eyes forward, back stiff, tail up. Kobaya did his best to imitate Psychox's gesture, but without a tail, it fell a little flat. Until then, you work in the engine with Psychox. Dismissed. Centurion Harrow bit out the word between gleaming fangs. Psychox and Kobaya backed away cautiously. When they reached the edge of the forecastle and jumped down onto the main deck, Psychox sighed. Not what you expected, I gather, Kobaya muttered. Well, uh, not exactly. I was expecting the part about murdering you. Nice. Glad to know something went the way you planned. Kobaya met the eye of the black-furred char sailor, and a chill went down his spine. Despite the centurion's orders, the soldier looked as if he'd rather have been gutting Kobaya than working with him. Kobaya murmured, They'll kill me, won't they? They catch me alone? Yeah, probably. The hatred of humans is part of our blood. You worship false gods. You betray your promises, and you smell kind of like a wallowing Murello. There are old wounds, deep ones that go back generations, like the war in Ascalon. What about the humans? The Shar stole our homeland. Stung, Kobaya nevertheless was careful to keep his voice down. If your people hadn't tried to conquer Ascalon, King Adelburn wouldn't have cursed the kingdom, and humans would still live there. I say forecastle. You say Fusisle. If the humans hadn't stolen Ascalon from us a few hundred years before, we wouldn't have had to fight to get it back, Psychox retorted. At least the Shar had the good grace not to shatter a city and enslave the souls of the populace as a fare thee well. Your King Adelburn, who, howdy? He was a stinker. Kobaya steamed a bit, at a loss for words. I can already tell I'm going to hate arguing with you. Arguments are like battles. If you don't have superior firepower, don't engage. Psychox grinned. How about you? Why don't you hate humans as much as they do? Psychox looked down at him appraisingly. With a shrug, he said, I recognized what was left of the pennon tangled up with you and that mast. See? I was raised in a Ferrar. That's like a cub training school, near the border of Crita. We spent a lot of time studying the people who lived in Lion's Arch. Guess I always wanted to meet one. He lifted one paw and licked it, rubbing the damp pads over his tangled mane to smooth the fur. Don't worry about the other sailor's mouse. You'll be working in the engine room, and I'll be there with you. After the wave hit us, the bellows blew, and most of the char who worked down there with me died in the explosion. I managed to save the ship but I couldn't save them. Psychox turned his head and pretended to smooth down another patch of fur. But Kobaya could see pain echoed in the bestial soldier's eyes. Your crew means that much to you? He asked, more gently. They're my warband. I grew up with some of these lowlifes. That's what warband means to a char. Family. It's the only family a char ever knows. Only family they ever need. Kobaya had never thought he'd have a meaningful conversation with a char. If anyone had asked, he'd have said the murderous, bestial char couldn't even string sentences together, much less express the kind of regret and pain he heard in Psychox's tone. Shaking his head, the rust-furred char growled deep within his throat and changed the subject. Follow me, human. I'll take you down to the bellows and let you see our ship's beating heart. 
Kobaya grinned and followed his strange companion toward the lower hold. The havoc had a strange quality to it, a sort of stilted chugging that Kobaya had never felt aboard any other ship. As they walked down a curled stairwell, he could feel the air growing heavier, thicker with the stench of acrid smoke. On the Indomitable, the rear quarterdeck had housed the captain and his officers. Here, the Havoc's quarterdeck had been entirely opened up from the keel to the roof of the highest deck, so that the room itself was twice as high. Instead of stained glass windows and polished candelabra, the room was dark and muggy, as hot as hell, and twice as cavernous. A strange contraption made of steel and bronze had been built at the rear of the Havoc. It looked like a squatting toad with a flickering tongue of orange flame that darted out between its iron teeth. Piles of coal lay in a massive metal bin to one side, with two large shovels sticking out of the top like headstones in a graveyard. To each side of the engine was a great circular crank, ticking in unison with some inner working of the engine. Chains clanked and shivered leashing the contraption to a massive cog at the rear. As it clicked in circles, the motion turned a rotary paddle wheel beneath the ship's hull and propelled the havoc forward. You built this? Kobaya stared in amazement. I built it, and I run it. Psycox grabbed one of the shovels and yanked it out of the coal bin. Shoving the handle against Kobaya's chest, Psycox added, Now you run it, too. How does this thing work? Kobaya rolled up his sleeves, struggling to hold the shovel in one hand and wipe the smoke from his face with the other. The... Isn't your concern, Mouse? Psycox smiled. Just keep shoveling coal till we make port. And when we make port, what then? A new voice cut in. It had a nasal tone, and condescension hung on every syllable. We get blown out of the water by the lion guard? You're an optimistic fur bucket, Psycox. Making for Lion's Arch is a stupid plan. I thought you said there weren't any other char down here, Psycox, Kobaya said. A shadow stepped out of the smoke near the engine's main cog. It was small, topping out barely higher than Kobaya's waist, and it definitely didn't move like a char. How did you know we were making for Lion's Arch? Psycox blurted challengingly. Shaking a clawed paw, I talked Centurion Harrow into that plan only yesterday. I hear everything that happens aboard this blasted ship, you loudmouthed blunderbuss. So, tell me, when we reach this aforementioned port, what do we do then? The figure walked into the light of the engine fire, and Kobaya could finally see it clearly. It was a woman, well, at least it was female, as far as he could tell. She marched forward and stuck her hands on her hips, with a ferocious attitude and a toss of her head, making her long ears flap against her shoulders. A thickly braided loop of leather on the top of her head held back dyed braids that cascaded down her back and over one shoulder in a cacophony of rampant color, none of which looked the least bit natural. Orange Green, blue, and pink vied for dominance against the little creature's pale skin. Wide eyes glinted like obsidian chips, and her bowed mouth was set in a frown of disapproval. She wore an embroidered blue smock with a magical-looking bird's-eye pattern stitched on the chest, and blue-black feathers hung from gold cuffs above her elbows. As she talked, her hands flapped and the motion reminded Kobaya of a bird struggling to fly. Although Kobaya was already sweating, and poor Psychox looked to be broiling under his thick coat of fur, the interloper seemed perfectly comfortable despite the engine's intense heat. Psychox jerked a thumb toward Kobaya with a rough chuckle. Kobaya, meet Macha, our Aserin stowaway. Macha, this is Kobaya, the mouse I netted out of the sea. Stowaway? The creature's eyes flashed. Slanderous, libelous, extraplanderous accusations, steam shroud? How dare you show such tooth to me? Masha stomped forward and shook an accusatory finger at Psycox's belly, pointing up toward the big char's nose. I was invited to be part of this crew, Fuzzwad. Invited, I say. Invited, 
Psychox snorted, amused. Blackmailed your way aboard is more like it, Matcha. You say Firefly? I say, bioelectric pharmaceutical neonite. The Asura brushed imaginary dust motes from her ornamented robe. A few of my harsher critics may have discovered certain anatomical difficulties upon rising one morning. Yes, and perhaps those issues caused me to seek a vacation outside the camp, I suppose, yes. But to be quite honest, your ship has more than benefited from my presence. I consider the utilization of my genius to be more than repayment for a meager birth. What's she talking about? Kobaya asked, in a whisper. Some of the other Asura said Macha's latest experiment was too dangerous. Psychox murmured. They woke up dead. If they'd altered their tangents to the proper coefficient and redone the math like I told them to, they'd never have experienced that particular side effect. Macha lifted her nose imperiously. I left their successors to deal with the ramifications of their unfortunate lack of forethought. Meaning, Psychox said, rolling his eyes. She stowed aboard the havoc to escape a lynch mob. Oversimplified. Distinctly distorted. A multifarious misstatement. Macha sniffed and crossed her feather-ornamented arms. The truth is that I negotiated a profitable exchange my security aboard this ship in return for an investment of my brilliance during the voyage. Negotiated after we put to sea. But she'll say that's equally irrelevant. In any case, Macha's been tinkering with the engines since we left shore. What? Is she? Kobaya managed to ask, trying not to move or get the little creature's attention. What is she? Macha turned her waggling finger on him. She is an Asura. What are you? You ignoramus, that you don't know an Asura when you see one? Asura? Kobaya knew the word, but he'd never seen one. All he knew about Asura was that they were odd underground creatures that lived in the deep Maguma jungle. Yes, Asura. Not very good with words, is he? Macha raised an eyebrow. Doesn't have to be, so long as he can shovel coal. Psychox thumped Kobaya on the back of his shoulder, shoving him forward. Say hello, Kobaya. Kobaya grinned sheepishly. I've never met an Azura. It's a pleasure. He held out his hand, unsure if Asura greeted one another like humans did. To his relief, Macha took it. I'd say it's a pleasure back, but I have met humans. The diminutive woman tossed her head, ears flapping to either side, and fixed him with an appraising stare. So, Kobaya, can you do anything useful? With a smile, Kobaya answered, I can read an astrolabe. He pulled the brass device out of his vest and saw the Asara's eyes light up like furnace flames. Well, well, well. Macha grinned, rubbing her hands together. An educated human. How abnormal. How unexpected. Between that device and this engine, we might just make it to Lion's Arch after all. Psychox smiled. I told you, Macha. Everything will work out just fine. With a bark of laughter, the char shoved them both toward the coal pile. With the three of us working together, nothing could possibly go wrong. You'll see?